Hello and welcome to this special bonus episode of The Dairy Edge. Chagas are running a weekly Let's Talk Dairy webinar series, which is also being made available as a podcast. On this week's webinar, Stuart Childs is joined by nutrition specialist Joe Patton to set out body condition score targets at this time of year and steps to rectify body condition score in cows that are over and under conditioned. Additionally, John Paul Murphy, farm manager at Chagas Moor Park and dairy advisor John McCabe assess the condition across a number of cows at Moor Park. Today um, I'm joined by Joe Patton again. Joe was wearing his winter milk hat a couple of weeks ago with Aidan in uh, Johnstone Castle and today he's wearing his uh, nutritionist specialist uh, role hat in relation to body condition and how we're going to deal with that. So um, the lads are in Moor Park there, John McCabe and John Paul Murphy, our farm manager in the Moor Park farm, uh, are just getting set up there at the moment. They have a couple of cows in a crush that they're going to show us in terms of the body condition score uh, and just uh, outline how often John Paul does it and the decisions that he makes around it. And then Joe is going to talk about how to deal with cows that may be a little bit in the low side in terms of condition, um, coming into very close to dry off now at this stage. And... Um, Obviously, maybe time getting a bit tight for some of these ladies to be in proper order for calving. So um, John is doing a lot of discussion groups out in the, on the around the territory down around Moor Park, and he's of the opinion that some there's a lot of first calvers still milking, at the, and they're going to be under pressure if they're going to calve in February in terms of body condition. So we will pick up with, uh, a little bit with those. And um, George, you want to make any comment there just while we're getting? set there with John in relation to uh, yeah. we'll say maybe cows even I, uh, another you have two extremes I suppose you have the thin cow and you have cows that are maybe mm-hmm. after getting fat over the course of the late lactation maybe not milking a lot but milking on and putting that condition on uh, on their backs as well so how we deal with those yeah Morning, Stuart. Yeah, look, I suppose as the lads are getting, they're nearly ready to go there. But I suppose, yeah, there's there's plenty of charts and plenty of stuff about, you know, what the optimal what the optimal condition is. And we hear two, seven, you know, three and a quarter or three, three and a half, whatever the figure might be. But I think the maybe the lads as to go through it now, I think the main thing really is to just get a, a practical feel for what the right condition looks like. And maybe most importantly then, and maybe John Paul will come to that, is you have to make a decision on it. There's no point in going out and scoring the herd and saying, yeah, well, you know, that's that's the condition score. It's the decision you make after, I suppose, that's the that's the, the, the main thing. So I suppose at this stage, we're probably looking for, we probably want to be looking and finding out the ones that are a bit behind target. They're going to be at risk of, um, you know, poor production and maybe poor fertility next year. So really, when you talk about the effect of nutrition on fertility, a big part of that is body condition score at, at drying off or a body condition score at calving down, really. So that's the first thing. So 210, you you could run into problems with fertility next year. And obviously, over-conditioned and too heavy or too fat at, at calving down, uh, the risk is then really problems with metabolic diseases like milk fever. So it's trying to get that fit but not fat thing in the middle. So maybe let the lads have a look there and see what they have in, in Moor Park and see what see what the cows are like there. So John, maybe, yeah, we're ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. How are you lads? Uh, so I'm just joined here with uh, John Paul Murphy, who's farm manager here in Moor Park. Uh, and so we're just going to go through the uh, technique of the body condition scoring and uh, a few bits around the body condition scoring schedule here in the year and what what, uh, what decisions to make around it. So uh, John Paul here in Moor Park, uh, just going to go through the condition scoring of some of the cows. Uh, I suppose it's a basic technique of checking the fat reserves on the cow. So we're going from a, a very thin to a very fat score. We're going from one to five, from into of 2.5. So I really want to see what the fat reserve is on the cow at any given time. So there's three main points you want to work off of. You want to work off of the pins at the back, the line up here, and the ribs. So as you can see, in the back of this cow, the pins are very prominent. Again, the line is very sharp. You can see the five indentations here, and the ribs the same. So this cow, to me, I would score at, at um, two and a half. So quite low at the moment. Uh, she has been dried off, so it's two and a half to give her. Uh, the next cow here is slightly different. As you can see visually, the cover is a bit stronger. The pin bones, small bit more flesh in them. Over the line again is a bit more flesh and down along the rib a bit more. So I suppose the key when you're actually physically body scoring cows is to make sure that your hand is actually uh, flat and firm at all times. So when you're at the back, you can put the fingers in here, which is okay, and over the line then, Press in nice and firm so you can feel the sharpness of the ribs or the line. 
So we move on to this cow again. The next cow here is actually in good body condition score. She's a condition score of three. Visually, you can see she's a, a heavier frame in her. And the, at the back of her here in the pins, there's a, a, a stronger um, cover of a fattener. Can I just go around there? Yeah, perfect. So as you can see, she's, more, she, she's a, a lot more fat over here. And just up along the line again, you put the hand flat here, not near as sharp as any of the other cows, uh, a, a bit more cover again, and down along the ribs. This lady again, we score her at 325. She's a lot more cover here. Over the line again, you, you can only barely feel the, 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 the ribs. At nine, and down along the ribs again, you've cover here. This cow here is smaller than fat, as you can see at the back. She is over fat, well over fat. She's a condition score of probably 375, uh, too, too, too heavy read, to be honest. So up along the line again, huge cover here, and down along the ribs, uh, massive cover again. Uh, I suppose one big thing, I suppose, when you're actually doing this in the crush, you don't want the animals bailed up too much. You want to give them space and freedom to stand so they're not pressed up against each other. So that their arch won't be up in the um, their back won't be arched up in the air and they won't be um, flexing their muscles or whatever. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So um, th there we go. There's uh, five or six cows in a row in 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 order of condition, and and that's the main uh, way you do it, uh, John Paul. John Paul, another another thing on body condition scoring. Do you look at the V there on on the on, on the on the hips. Yeah, exactly. We do. We want to make sure that, um, I suppose, from a, from a visual point of view, that um, the, the V is uh, not too strong. To just maybe here, if you if there's a like a, a very uh, a very prominent V, Jim, maybe maybe you might see a cow there in uh, March or April. That's after yes. there's a lot of conditions. From you a visual point a of view, prominent V here, but you see here, there's absolutely no uh, there's no difference. There's a full fat cover over this cow, uh, so. We might just go down and look at the tennis one here and yeah. just to show that bit. John, just while you're going down there, there's a question in, uh, does John Paul think that there's any difference in, in condition scoring the Frisian cows versus crossbred cows? I think we might be after losing you, John. You might be after moving too sure. far away yeah. from the signal. Uh, right. Yeah. So, George, do you want to pick up on that, maybe? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. Uh, it's a good question from Connor. Maybe I don't think the condition... The condition probably not that different in terms of the, the, the keep the scale and the and the technique the same maybe, but maybe it is something that some farms are saying particularly now is to see maybe more um, as a lot of more there's a lot obviously a lot more mature crossbred cows around maybe they're at slightly higher risk of over conditioning um, Stuart. Yeah okay I think the boys, they're are, in, they're, boys are back there. Yeah, their intake so. you know they, yeah can, it's can you hear us again? Yeah yeah their intake again, there, yeah. goes over the dry period. <laughs> Sorry, sure, yeah. it's, it's, All right. Sorry about that, lads. We no, lost, okay. connection. lost connection, yeah, Grant. Um, so could you relay the question again there to me, sure, please? Yeah, it was just Connor Creedon was asking, is there a difference in uh, condition scoring the black and whites versus the crossbreds? Okay, so we have a question in there from uh, Connor Creedon. So is there a difference between body condition score and the black and whites versus body condition score and the crossbreds? There's not really, no, it's, 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 again, it's down to your, the physical field, you might, there's no difference in, in the body condition score now. Okay, so it's all about putting the hand on the cow. Exactly, and the firmness of yeah. the hand, you, 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 you have to actually put them in the crush to, to know exactly how you, what your fat reserve is on your cow. Okay. And uh, John Paul, just a question there for myself, so um, what's the schedule for body condition score in here during the year, and have you done it this autumn yet? Now, I suppose as a research farm, we're doing it very regularly here, we do uh, twice a month, but I suppose from a farm perspective, we'd like to do it probably two to three times in the year. So I would have all my cows done well in advance of October, so I know what my cows are uh, coming into the end of the year and, and pre-drying off. So I suppose what I'm trying to do there is I'm trying to select any cow that's in low condition score, and maybe some of my uh, first lactation heifers, uh, pick them out early for drying off and to work on them especially. Um, and then again, uh, pre-breeding, maybe five to six weeks, pre-breeding is another good time to do it because you're, you have everything in control ahead of the, the breeding season. So we would always make sure it's done at that stage as well. Very good. And I suppose, John Paul, the, the, the key point there is that you're acting early, you're getting it done in, in October and you're giving them the longer dry period. But, exactly. Yeah. You're giving them a chance, yourself a chance to react. And you can make changes. If you leave it too late, you, you can't make changes. So I would say the sooner you can do it, mid-October, this 
in, in this time of the season, just so you're well in advance of the of the drying off period. Just a question. Uh, over to you, uh, Stuart, if you have any questions. Yeah. To, just the targets, I suppose, that uh, John Paul is operating to, uh, John, is the one question that's come in there. Okay, just the targets that you're oper operating at, John Paul. Yeah, so presently, I suppose, I have my condition score to cows at the moment is about 2.85. Um, I'm looking to be calving down somewhere between three and three and a quarter. So we have to come up to that at the moment. So we have to bring it up probably another uh, point three to bring it up more, you know. So again, pre-breeding again, we want the cows uh, around, around, the, around the tree again at a breeding time. Okay, and are you managing body condition scores throughout the dry period then? I, yes. Are you pulling out like uh, a few very, very over-conditioned yeah, exactly. so look, I'll, I'll, I'll batch my cows. I said we have condition score here again this week. We've done it last week. And we'll batch the cows accordingly. So any cow that might be below 275 will get certain treatment. Your silage could well be good enough quality for that. But maybe if cows were lower than that, they need, need some additional feed to get into the point before calving. Okay, and uh, do you know what, what DMD, the silage is, is going into the dry cows over the, over the dry period, yeah, or is uh, it varying? It, it's not too bad, it's very consistent. It's 78% um, DMD at the moment. Yeah, two bits, so we're quite happy. Okay, all right, so, so that's, um, that's, that's fairly high, so, so you'd want, you'd want to watch that you wouldn't be over-conditioned cows. So, exactly, and that's uh, another thing as well. Is you, you'll talk about batching cows while they go, the, the cows in high condition will be restricted on feed, and they're batched as well. But I think it, it, it can be done very simply by just pulling out the, the few worst offenders, I think, rather than just go, going through the whole herd. Yeah. That's it. Like, and it's usually small numbers. And if you can if you one bit of space, just to batch them out, it can make it very easy. And John, just one comment in from John Paul, because he's been fair manager for a good number of years now, but we'll say as the time has gone on and EBI has progressed within the herd, now we, we would have always had a good genetic merit in the herd in, in Moor Park anyway. But has he noticed cows better to retain condition, we'll say, as EBI has improved? Okay, so just a, a comment from yourself, John Paul, about um, you've, you've been here for, for a good few years and you've seen... Um, higher EBI cows coming in as the, as the breeding program progresses. Yeah. Uh, have you seen any difference in, in how body condition of, uh, of the higher EBI cows last throughout, throughout, the, throughout the season, the spring and in the autumn? Or, um, again, I suppose the body condition score is, 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 is as good as anyone, but at the same time, it's about uh, the dry matter intake for me is one of the big things. Make sure your cows have enough intake all the time and once they're meeting that, there, there's no issues whatsoever, you know? Okay, okay, yeah. So I suppose uh, a comment from myself there, sure. I kind of would see uh, some high EBI herds seem to hold condition in the spring. Um, but again, a lot of it comes out of the manager that the, the manager is, again, it's looking at dry matter intake and, and, and body, managing the body condition score um, throughout the season. Very good. Any so, more questions? No, that's it. No, I think uh, we're okay. We'll switch over to Joe. So, so thanks a million, John Paul, and thanks, John, as well. And thanks to the, the thanks ladies so who volunteered there for condition scoring. <laughs> yeah. All right, Joe. Very good, short. Yeah. Yeah. Look, yeah, just a couple of things on that, I suppose. Yeah, definitely on, on the crossbred thing. Yeah. Look, it's just a case that maybe the intakes on crossbreds per kilo of body weight is an advantage, obviously, when they're on grass. Um, but just watch to, to don't get over conditioned because they, they can eat, um, they can still eat, you know, they can still eat very well relative to their body weight as dry cows. So some there's some farms maybe saying that you just have to be careful on the on maybe the late, you know, if certainly if they're marsh carvers or whatever, to make sure they don't get over over conditioned, I suppose. Yeah. Um, um, where's, the, where's the tipping so yeah, point, so Jordan, um, in terms of, we'll say, obviously trying to get the balance right for the dry period, but not letting them get over conditioned? Like, what's in. Yeah, look at like it. I, I would always say it, it, you need eight weeks, really, no matter what way you look at it, because they're only going to be dry for six weeks, really. Like. Yeah, you're looking at eight, eight weeks, I suppose, anyway. And as John Paul was saying there, maybe the, the first cow he looked at at the back of the crush that was a two and a half, you're saying, look, if that's a February calver now, or certainly certainly if it's a February calver, maybe early March, you're probably thinking, um, yeah, uh, maybe a couple of extra weeks break for that for that um, for that animal, just to give her a chance to put a little bit of additional a little bit of an additional condition uh, on. Now, John Paul's at, at high mid seventies is high. It's high DMD silage for dry cows. We would probably say maybe seventy. 70 as a standard dry cow uh, silage would probably be enough for most most cows getting sort of eight to ten weeks dry maybe 12 weeks for the heifers 70 dmd silage will probably allow you to gain sort of somewhere around the quarter of a score to maybe 0.4 of a score depending on the um 
uh, dependent on, on, on the length of the dry period. So um, if silage quality is very high, like over, you know, over 75, and maybe if cows are already at a condition score of three, and maybe the later calvers in that situation would want to be, they would want their intake limited uh, over the early part of the dry period. I would just say that like that, if you're going to make, if you're worried about cows that are over conditioned, Stuart, it's probably, and they're maybe in the March side of things calving down, and maybe if you're fully dry for, for, for Christmas or whatever, it's the sort of December, January time is the time to sort of hold them back. When you get closer to calving down, really what you want to be doing is allow the cow to eat the appetite in the last couple of weeks anyway, because they're not naturally going to drop off in, in intake and naturally going to go into sort of a negative energy balance. So really, once you get to sort of three weeks from calving, it's too late really to be doing it in a bit condition. Do you know what I mean? So just be yeah, careful on that. Physically can't yeah. intake anyway in that last three to four weeks. Exactly. So they're so, kind of naturally restricting themselves anyway and you don't want to be further. Exactly. So it, it's, yeah, exactly. So it's the, it's the mid, it's the it's sort of the mid, you know, the sort of deep mid, sort of the midpoint and the, before the midpoint in the dry period really, up to that first, you know, the cup first month month or six weeks dry is when you want to be if you need to uh, making savings on or ma making restrictions now the first cow at the top of the crush that john paul showed like you probably wouldn't want her calving down any more than what she's at at the yeah. moment yeah. uh and you know in that case you're probably saying you, you really want that cow sort of calving down probably um the same as she went dry, not gaining a whole lot at all now look at i would i would take your point on the on the ebi thing there's a sort of a Definitely um, looking at some of Stephen's work and some of the stuff we did years ago ourselves, looking at that, EB, higher EBI cows do have the capacity to hold on to body condition a bit better or maybe turn the corner in the spring a little bit better. But, you know, obviously John Paul is right on the, you know, no point in having the genetics for body condition if you don't feed them. Uh, certainly, but it, do, it is an advantage to do allow you to sort of manage body condition, um, uh, manage body condition that bit easier so there is there, there is something in that I think in terms of the the breed type but one of the most important things maybe around that and one of the the one of the benefits of a higher fertility sub index I think um from a body condition management point of view is that if you can get cows calving once every 365 or once every 370 days it kind of naturally fits into kind of 290 to 300 days milking and then you're 60, sort of 60 to 70 days dry, right? I, I see it a lot in a lot of, I've seen a lot of herds over the years, maybe where genetics for fertility was poor and you had cows that were having, you know, long calving intervals and extended dry periods. Those were the ones that were most risky of problems with body condition because the calve down lost a heap of weight, then they put on far too much condition as stale cows or carryover cows and they come back in then and the cycle repeats itself in terms of problems. So I think if you can get the cows calving once every 365, once 365 to 370 days in a roundabout way, that's nearly the, that's one of the most important things in terms of being able to manage body condition, funny enough, you know. Block, kind of managing everything in the block, Joe, like. Yeah, exactly. And that goes for winter and spring herds like Stuart. I know we had Aidan on a couple of weeks ago uh, from, from Johnstown and he's calving once every 370 days, spring and autumn alike. And he has very little issues in terms of, you know, metabolic problems or, or over-conditioned cows because the cows are kind of, they're getting their, they're doing their 300 days and then they have their 60 days dry or 65 days dry and that's it. There's no kind of 100 days dry and all the problems that come with that, you know, in terms of uh, issues with extended lactations and all that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. So, will I just share a couple of things maybe and... and, and Yeah, uh, and, and while you're sharing it there, there's just a question in from Padraig Amoraku there. He's 79 DMD silage so, and you're saying to restricted can you expand further he's going to start drying up today so um i suppose like when we say restricting i all I, I would think that we're talking about that they just run out rather than having heaps of it in front of them all the time and constantly keeping it pushed into them to make sure that they eat loads of it like you feed them today and, and let them run through till tomorrow kind of scenario yeah, you want you want to be sort of trying to work out. Um, I'll, I'll just I'll come to that there in, okay. to, to cover Park's question in a second. It's just that's your that's your chart there, um, Stuart. Is that on your screen there? You can see yeah, that. Yeah, that's got your full screen there. So yeah, sorry. Yeah, so that's that's kind of um, that's what we would be saying. It's kind of you know it's, it was a good question. Where do we want if we could manage to keep the cows at condition score three every day of the year, we'd be happy pretty much. So really what we're saying that if they calve a three and a quarter and they're kind of down at 275 at their lowest in the spring and they're rising back towards 275 to three at breeding, we're happy enough. That's the range we want to keep them in. Up at four, 
ready for the factory and a time bomb as far as milk fever is concerned. Down at two and a half, you're probably talking, that's a very shelly kind of ruby type of a cow. The chances are in the spring, you're going to lose milk production on those. And also, they're, the, they're likely be the ones that need, will need a seeder in April to get them going, right? So that's why, we're, that's why it's so important that we talk about this kind of, this condition. And, you know, it's often said, you know, it, it is important when we say that nutrition has an effect on fertility. Of course it has, but it mightn't be, the, it mightn't be the nut that you're feeding on the day that the straw goes into the cow that affects the, the fertility. It might actually be how you decide to manage the body condition score this week and next week, rather than, um, you know, what you do on, for, the, for the week before breeding. Because generally speaking, think about it, it's, the, it's what happens three or four months before breeding that really, that really affects the, the chances of, of a good breeding season. So that's, that's an important point. Uh, look at, um, well, we talk about feeding targets for dry cows, right? So just if we take sort of standard kind of thin at drying off, we're talking about nine units of energy or thereabouts. Uh, if they're sort of 275 at drying off, you're talking about eight units of energy or thereabouts, which is kind of 11 kilos of, it's 11 kilos of sort of 70 DMD silage or something, something in that, it's something in that, in that picture, right? The problem with your, with your, with your, with your, um, with your 78 DMD silage probably for dry cows is that basically they're going to eat more than the 11 kilos. They could eat up to 13 kilos of it. And obviously the intake, the energy content of it is higher. So the total, the total uh, intake could be up to 10 kilos of, of, um, of dry matter, or sorry, of, of energy, 10 units of dry, of, of 10 units of energy intake, sorry, which could lead you to sort of gain and maybe up to half a score of condition, which is too much. So look at here, uh, Stuart, if you say 72 DMD silage even over eight weeks, you're probably talking about gaining somewhere around 0.4 of a score. Uh, if you give them another six weeks on top of that, so a longer dry period, you could be talking about 0.4 and 0.5 up to nearly a full condition score uh, gain over sort of an extended dry period so that would be sort of um going from two and a half to three and a half so you'd turn a thin cow into a slightly overconditioned cow with 14 weeks on 72 dmd silage so at 77 78 you'd probably be looking at trying to limit that to sort of 10 kilos of dry matter intake basically that would be the that would be the issue or certainly if there was if there was second cut or maybe poorer quality stuff to be fed in the middle of winter i think in the middle of the dry period you probably would be um you would probably try to try to do that. So diluting it down really would be that would be the thing to be to be looking at. All right. So you know, and that's the maybe that's the issue too, Stuart. That there's there's such a range in silage quality, and if we do need to make the decision based on silage quality. If you look here, our 68, 70 DMD silage, 68 would be kind of where the average would be. You're probably talking about gaining a quarter of a score over eight weeks. So you're talking about your cows that John Paul showed there, maybe at 275 to three that would be that are already kind of warmed up if you like and are in decent shape uh, eight to ten weeks on a on a sort of standard silage for them will bring them in at the right condition however if your silage is kind of 65 and under uh, the chances are that over an eight-week dry period the cow will actually lose condition uh, and even after giving her an extra six weeks dry to allow for a bit more settling in terms of intake and that if you take the, take the two of these together, the chances are that at 62, 64 DMD, even over after a, after a relatively extended dry period, the chances are that the, uh, the cow will calve in probably not much different than she went dry. So if she's already at three and a quarter and she's on that sort of stuff, she might be all right. Uh, if she's already thin and you're putting her on very poor silage, uh, she's going to calve down, she's going to calve down thin. So in that case, you're really talking about sort of Thin cows and poor silage, you're talking about supplementation. Average type of silage and decent condition, you're probably talking about being able to ad lib feed that. Higher quality silage on cows that are already maybe at the at, in good shape, you probably need to be thinking about feed restriction in some way on those ones. All right. Okay, so Padraig, Padraig and Mark, who's back in again there when you're saying dilute, does that mean add in straw? Um, if, if the silage is up at 78 uh, for dry cows pork, it's almost to the point where you're saying um, at, at that level, you, you'd probably be saying it, it, might be, it, might, it might have to be done. Yeah, it might have to be done. You're probably talking about, you're probably talking about bringing sort of a couple to three kilos of straw included. I would think it's probably 
depending if you're if you're set up for that, I think that might be the it might be the thing to do. Now I know straw is kind of it's hard to get your hands on it. It's hard to get your hands on it this year, but I think at se- at at the lower seventies, you probably get away with just feed restricting it. But at very that like the silage you're talking about there is really good quality silage for milking cows, right? And you know, would you feed a milking cow diet to a to a dry cow? You shouldn't really, because the the over conditioning and the problems with milk fever that could hit you next spring. I think you're going to have to feed restrict, uh, and maybe some dilution of straw might be might be necessary uh, in that situation, right? So that's that's what we're that's what we probably would have to say. So probably you're talking something like two to three kilos of straw, and just making sure that if you come into the late dry period, so coming into the time just pre calving, just ensure that there's um make sure there's adequate protein in the diet overall. So 12% protein in the diet overall. So possibly you might need to feed a protein source, something like a very small amount of soya or something, uh, just for the couple of weeks before calving to ensure that colostrum quality uh, is good. But there's no need to go crazy on protein as we look at um, we look at it in a second. Just one uh, thing, as, as Stuart, when, when Porik brought that up, I just wanted maybe just show when we talk about this need for straw or not need for straw, I think in the circumstance where you're talking about there and you're talking about trying to really dilute out the where you're talking about trying to dilute out the energy content of a, a silage that probably isn't suitable for dry cows. To be to be honest, it's it's a very very good silage by the sounds of it for milkers, but maybe not for for dry cows. Uh, there might be need for some dilution. But I just wanted to make just to clarify one point about this: the the the, the need or otherwise for straw. Maybe if you're in a feed restricted situation, which is slightly slightly different, where you're trying to make up the diet rather than trying to dilute it out. Here's a just some stuff done <clears throat> in 2018 with Mike Egan. Uh, in Moor Park, where we looked at um, options where maybe silage was tight. It's just to illustrate the point now on the straw. So they had silage at 100% uh, in the diet. They had silage and meal, which was basically if you were short of silage and you had meal uh, to make up the difference. Uh, and then they had silage and, and meal, but straw included to bulk up the diet, right? So this is to bulk up the diet and saying, well, you know, if I needed to feed silage and meal, do I need to fill the cow essentially with with bulk in order to keep her to keep her to keep her right. So uh, if you're talking about feeding meal as well. So look at in that situation, you're basically saying that um, the intakes of, of UFL here is your energy. So your energy intakes were similar across the lot. Um, and then you're talking about your silage, your straw, uh, and then your silage and meal only. So basically when they when they did those out, um, body condition at the end of the sea at the end of the dry period was the same. Body condition score gain was relatively similar, calf birth weight was relatively similar, milk yield after calving was similar, calving difficulty was similar. There wasn't a whole pile of difference in there wasn't a whole pile of difference in whether you bulked up the diet with straw or not. So it depends on what you, it kind of depends on the situation you're in. So really what, what are we actually saying there? We're saying that if you're in a feed restricted situation, maybe if you're short of silage and you're going with silage and meals, you know, putting in the straw didn't really, didn't add that much of an advantage really. Maybe in Porrick's situation, if he has straw available, he already has very, very good silage and he's trying to dilute that down a little bit. Uh, a couple of kilos is probably, it's probably no harm at all, but it's not, it's not essential to feed the extra bulk if you're in a sort of silage plus meal type of situation. Is that, is that fair enough, Stuart? Yeah, that I, was suppose, a, I suppose yeah. The, the, the reason for looking at that was because of the high level of meal that was going in because of the lack of silage. And, exactly, the, yeah, exactly. So you so had to add in, a, add in a bit of extra fill. And one thing as well, Joe, actually going back to the previous slide, uh, you don't need to go back to it now, but just to, there's a double whammy when you're on poor quality silage as well, which is just to emphasize why people need to test silage, is that the intake, which is what you're just coming to actually here, sorry, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. the double whammy there is just going to hammer cows on poor, that are in poor condition on poor quality silage. Yeah, so just exactly. So just remember that when we talk about poor quality silage, it's a combination of the energy content per kilo of silage and also the intake that the, the actual is the amount of it that you will eat, right? So oftentimes you see, we, we look at it, we assume that the cow will eat 11 kilos of dry matter, right? And it, dep- it just depends then on the energy content of the silage. The real trick is on the intake, as you say, Stuart. So it's just to draw lads' attention to that figure on their, um, on their silage analysis. You'll see this intake uh, value figure, and it's written kind of weird in places. Maybe it's written as grams per kilo, 
body weight raised to the power of 0.7. Like, don't worry too much about that. That's just saying that it's, it's basically measured per kilo of body weight, essentially. So all we're saying here very simply is that sort of that we table there will, t will tell you. So the higher the intake value, the more, in, the more the cow will eat of it per kilo of her own body weight, essentially, right? So it's linked to body weight and it's linked to silage quality. So obviously, higher quality silage, the, the sort of 78 DMD that Porik spoke about, if that's well preserved, uh, good pH, uh, good dry matter, uh, you know, well preserved and high quality, you're gonna have a very high intake value. Obviously, if it's wet, acidic, um, low DMD, poor protein, the, the cow's just not gonna to want to eat uh, as much of it essentially. So what's the range then? So if you take a sort of a 625 kilo cow for handiness, we take the one in the middle, at a low intake value of 70, she might eat eight and a half kilos of it. But if you give, if you give, her, 100, give her stuff that's up at 110, she might eat up to 13, 13 and a half kilos of silage. So really we've always ended up in the 11 to 12 mark because it's basically the type of silage we've been making. Uh, so really 90 of an intake value, you're probably talking about 11 and a half. 100, you're probably talking 12 and a half and up to 13, enough to cause the cows to gain um, to gain too much weight. But as you say down here, probably not going to be meeting requirements. So if you're down at that level, Stuart, and you're down at maybe needing to gain a little bit of weight, uh, and the uh, intake value is poor and the cows need to gain a quarter of the condition and the silage is poor quality, you probably are talking about two kilos two kilos of something like barley and gluten, maybe 50-50, something like that. Two kilos of hulls, maybe maybe barley, gluten, something as simple as that might just make the difference on the thinner ones, right? So, you know, un unfortunately, nobody wants to have to go in and feed meal to, to dry cows, but in a situation if silage quality is poor and the cows are sort of, as they say, a bit shelly themselves, that couple of kilos can make quite a difference for, 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 for next year, I, I would say, all right? Yeah, I so, suppose it just it just emphasizes the importance of putting a focus on the silage, hmm. at, uh, making sure that you have the right type of silage available. Yeah, to you. exactly. Yeah, and look at I suppose look at this can get very complicated, and people say, well, you know, it's it's dry cow silage, and that's it. Uh, we don't need a lot of good stuff. But if we, if we just go back very simply and say that if we take our dry cows, right, if we take that figure roughly, right, uh, Stuart, of about 11 kilos of, of dry matter intake per cow per day while she's dry, right, and you say your cows are going to be dry for what? On average, well, we say 70 days on average for most, for most people, yeah. there or thereabouts, right? So you're saying that basically you need 11 kilos for 70 days. You need about eight, seven, seven, you need about 800 kilos dry matter of of sort of 69, 70 DMD silage for your dry cows, right? That's what you need uh, for the dry period. 0.8 8 of a ton, which is equivalent to about four bales worth, there or thereabouts. You need, that's what you need for your dry cows. And then all the rest of the silage in the yard should be good quality. Uh, that's for your heifers, uh, sorry, for your weanling heifers, for your stale cows in the autumn and for your fresh cows in the spring. So when you add that up, like you tell me what's a much, a much, um, how much silage does it does it does your standard uh, does your standard farmer around Mitchell Centre from I need in the yard? Did they need one point three, one point four ton per cow, one point five? Yeah, sure. We work off the we work off the one point five. Um, probably work off of close to five months requirements in a lot of cases. Right. So, yeah, yeah, and if stocking is higher, that's going to be higher. So basically, what we're saying that at one point five, we're saying that half your silage needs to be for dry cows, and the other half goes to milkers and 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 young stock. So half your silage, at least half your silage, needs to be good quality, maybe even a little bit more. It's always, it's probably easier to restrict good silage than it is to make up for bad stuff. So we need yeah. to move away from the notion that what we're talking about here is, you know, making a few bales for the, for the a few surplus bales as quality, and the rest can be, you know, basically a pile of glorified straw, you know. That can't be the way. Can't be the way, particularly, particularly as we're extending into into longer into longer lactations, right? So, um, so look at that's the that's the that's an I thought that was an interesting study actually that it just puts the question of whether if you're in a feed restricted situation, do you need to dilute with straw? The suggestion there would be. The suggestion there is clear enough that, and if you look here, that they've basically had the same energy and protein no matter which way you made it up, right? As long as you met, as long as the energy and protein requirements of the cow were met and the mineral requirements of the cow were met, it didn't really make that much difference how you arrived at it, whether that was silage or a combination of silage and straw and meal or just silage and meal. 
as long as, you, as long as the energy intake values were correct and hit the targets, you were happy enough that the cows came out the same at the other end, if you, if you get me. All right? Yeah, so, sure. The same is true of uh, in calf heifers can be, and weanling heifers can be run on a straw and meal only diet in some cases too, quite like the energy density of the diet is, exactly. is the same. It's just exactly, how, you, exactly. how you make it up is the thing. It's, like. it, 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 that's exactly it. And just, just one other final point, maybe we might do, keep it moving. That one other final point is we look here, calf birth weight was sort of pretty much within a kilo or so of, of um, you know, across the treatments, right? And I know that certainly um, when we bring up the, when we bring up the, the 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 sort of the idea that some of the thinner cows might need a bit of sort of barley gluten to get them into shape for calving down, a lot of farms over the years would have said, well, I don't want to do that uh, because I don't want to grow the calf. I don't want to have I, the calf will be too big. Like you've often heard that one, I yeah. suppose. That so look, just to be clear on that one, that the condition the the cow will almost the cow will sort of manage her own intake in order to make sure that the calf gets what they need first and foremost so the calf's priority and then the it's the extra meal is really a, a question of whether the body condition is improved or not so it's not it, it's not actually that relevant of what happens to the size of the calf it's really the meal will be really it'll change the body condition of the cow not really the, the size of the calf just to, to really emphasize that mark mcgee in in grange did work on this a couple of years ago on in in continental suckler cows and they fed the cows that would they would either lose 40 kilos hold their weight or gain 50 kilos of weight over the dry period, right? Which is a huge range in terms of the, the, the density of the dry cow diet. And there was about a kilo difference on average birth weight across the groups. It had zero effect on the, on the, on the size of the calf, whether the cow was pretty much half starved, if you could say, well, that's not true either, but you know, to lose weight, to sort of hold the weight or to gain a lot of weight, it had zero effect on the size of the calf. It's the, it's the sire used uh, it's the sire and the dam's genetics that will dictate the calf size, not the not a couple of kilos a meal to a thin cow. All right. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. I suppose the, the other thing is if yeah. people are worried about that, like the, it's coming back to what John Paul and John were looking at below in the yard, it's condition scoring and start drying off cows early rather than having to feed meal if people. I, don't I, I, you I would, so like to know. Yeah, I would think so. Look, I think management. I'd rather do as John Paul was saying there. Like, what's easier, short here? Like, what's what John oh, Paul? For sure, I mean, John, and, and sure, you know as well, Joe. Like the vast majority of yards that we go into, we we do, like John Paul is blessed with the, the space and the facilities Ability, he has. Yeah. Like he can just break up groups of cows and stuff. But that isn't commonplace on on most farms. Like so. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just counting it up. Like if you count in the yard at Moor Park, there's um, there's six and four. There's ten, at least ten divisions, if you want, uh, in the yard. Most yards you go into, there's two at most, two, if not yeah. two. At, at, so look at, in fairness, like over the years, you've always seen that if there's with all with everybody coming in and out and the different trials going on, I think it's one thing that 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 John Paul would always insist on is that when when you get your cows back after the trials, that their 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 main, their, their body condition is right and that they calve down in the right condition. Otherwise, you know that makes that makes the spring easier. That's for sure. So a couple of extra, go out this evening, have a look. If they're a bit thin, think about trying them off that bit earlier. And it's much easier than having to split them out and feed them kilos of meal over the winter period to try and make them catch up. It's just it's far it's far handier, and you're not losing whatever bit of extra milk you get in the next two weeks. You'll gain that back easily by by the extra production uh, next next spring. You know, so that's the that's the one. Just another one. I just wanted to maybe touch on Stuart about maybe this is maybe moving further into the maybe maybe it's more of a question for next January maybe uh, if in early February the question about pre calf and protein right. And there's a fair bit of work done on this in 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 Moor Park and in the states and elsewhere uh, around how much protein do you actually do you actually need. And the, the the sort of the simple message here is that across a heap of different trials done, there's a you know it's basically plus or minus a, a half a kilo of milk or thereabouts depending on what how you change the protein percent, right? So look at the main thing is that if the consistent message is kind of hit the 12.5%, 12, 12.5% target for your dry cows. If you hit that target in terms of your total diet, that's the, that's the, hand, that's the best middle ground you're going to get. And there's very little evidence of any, uh, any advantage going higher than that. So if, you're, if your silage protein is sort of 13% 
I think you're pro on your 70 DMD at 13%, that's what you're getting to your dry cows in late dry period. You're fine, I think, in terms of protein content. If you're in a situation where silage quality is a bit raw, a bit poor, if you were short of silage and you were adding in straw or hay to try and stretch out feed, for example, and you were bringing the total protein of the diet of the forage part down maybe closer to 10%, there would be an advantage in including a, a supplementary protein source for the last couple of weeks. And I suppose the way to look at that, Stuart, is measure your colostrum quality uh, in next spring. And if your colostrum quality is good, uh, it's, that's the real, it's a real measure of whether your protein nutrition in your cows is decent enough uh, pre calving right? So people that are feeding poor quality silage or maybe feeding a lot of hay or straw or something, you'll often see that the, the, um, there's a lot of cows failing the, the colostrum test on the, on the refractometer. So it's a, just a nice, it's a nice measure, really, a practical outcome of, of it. So 12.5%, watch your heifers and your herds on poor silage. So obviously we're not here to talk about replacement heifers, but I do think that don't be shy in a, a little bit of additional protein uh, on those over the over the over the sort of December January period. It'll pay you back to to make sure that they, they meet their protein uh, requirements. The other one that comes up and it's an interesting one maybe before we we, we move on to something else is this question of feed and meal pre calving, right? And this is different now to what we're talking about. We are recommending for sure that if the cows are way behind body condition it's too, you know and it's maybe it's too late to give them the extended dry period feeding the cow correctly over the dry period to catch her up in terms of her body condition is recommended right that's the first point it's a slightly different thing then when we come to talk about is there a value in sort of starting to introduce meals pre calving to sort of get the cow ready for her diet post calving? Do you know what I'm? Do you know what yeah. I'm getting at, Stuart? Yeah. That's a different Fre question. Fre and freshening diet, like as such. A freshening diet and steaming up and this kind of yeah. stuff, right? And I don't know. Look, at, I, I, this has been talked about since the mid '90s, and it's something that I think. I think a lot of people might have tried it over the years and some people said, you know what, this is too much fucking more hassle than it's, than it's worth nearly because you have to start introducing meals pre calving But look, this is just some work done from a couple of years ago um, on in a system where, you know, and this is, I, this, I picked this one because it's representative of an, it's very simple, an awful lot of studies have the same outcome on this, right? But it, this is a system where you'd be talking about getting up to a 50, 60% concentrate diet post calving right? So look at, uh, feeding 17% starch, so that's feeding a high starch concentrate, or feeding a high starch diet, which is a concentrate diet pre-calving, uh, versus a you know a lower starch one, and then see what happens post-calving. So essentially, no difference post-calving really at all. So, um, you what you do is you end up increasing the intake pre-calving, but really not that difference. In, in there's no major benefit post-calving at all in terms of intake. Does it mean the cow will go on to her post-calving intake better because she got fed meal for a couple of weeks pre-calving? The answer to that is likely no, no big difference at all. There is a risk that of additional risk of ketosis because if that extra meal uh, causes over-conditioning, now again to emphasize we're talking about here where cows are already in good nick and we're talking about going in with extra meal to try and transition them on to the thing it's not the same as feeding the thin cow right uh, there is a bit of an extra risk of ketosis by doing it um, so look at i would be saying that really you know sometimes you see a benefit for a week or two post calving but you've bought that feed as meal pre calving or bought that milk as feed pre calving so we wouldn't be really recommending it at all i think and even talking to some of the lads in hillsborough over the last couple of years did say they've moved away from that notion and are going more towards making sure that they've got high quality forage for the diet post calving making sure your minerals are good uh, pre calving and getting the slow and steady intake a uh, slow and steady increase in intake after calving is much more important than trying to have the cow sort of ready to go on a high meal diet straight away, which doesn't really doesn't really work. All right, which so, is a good news story for farms because it means they don't have to bother with it. That's yeah. Essential. So the other the the what you're the point you're making, Joe, is all like your freshly calved cow start around the three kilos and yeah, depending, depending on your grass availability, maybe lift her up by a kilo a day or a kilo every two that, days. Yeah, and look at up the, to, your five exactly, exactly. Like, yeah, access to grass you have, etc. Like, and just, yeah. just to, sorry not to be flicking through slides, but ju just look at this for a second. That's your, that's your sort of. This is your cow. This day, this is calving day here on zero, right? And this is your calcium. This is your calcium levels, right? So cows without milk fever kind of come along, come along handy enough, and then they get this sort of a, a dip, right? 
Mm-hmm. Uh, they get a slight dip and then they're back to normal. The cows that get milk fever take a severe dip and then it takes them a couple of days to get over it, right? And what does that mean? At that point, if the blood calcium is very low, you're talking about a risk of downer cows, you're talking about a risk of displacements, you're talking about you know risks of even lame, even l- increased risk of lameness a, a few weeks down the line. There's a lot of risks with having low blood calcium status. So what are we really saying there? You know, you're back to normal after about three days anyway, like right or close to normal. So look after the cow for a few days after she calves, and then get around to her, get into her great, get her onto the grazing regime. You know, I would. You know, that's where a lot of us have have have, have gone now. I think. Transition uh, to cow post calving rather than transition, transition to cow post exactly. Like there's yeah. no point, no point in going in sort of st- steaming her up and then sending her out the first morning with the with the calf sort of still hanging out of her. Like it's not where we want to be. We sort of just give the cow a chance to get get her calcium status back into track. Um, you know, and I think a lot of people have been in that direction anyway with a colostrum mob maybe that's managed with a wee bit of extra TLC that the cow really gets looked after ex- extra attention until she's back in the tank essentially. And then after that, off you go and you, you, you're, you're away with it then. So it's the, it's the transition, as you say, the transition after calving into the main herd is probably more important than sort of this pre-calving concentrate notion. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Okay, very good. Okay. Do you want to say something about minerals or are, you, are we... Yeah, you can time? touch on it quickly, I suppose. The time frame for it as well, Job, and we'll wrap it up then at that. Yeah, like, so okay. how long should people be feeding the minerals for, et cetera? That. Okay, so look, the first thing I'm just going to make a point here is uh, this is our, this is our, we might have talked about this before, but I'm just going to, mm. just want to just make the, the point that the potassium levels, just check the potassium in your silage. If it's a 2.3% or thereabouts, you're probably okay with your standard mineral. If it's up at 3%, which is kind of what your kind of high quality silage might be or your grazed grass might be, just to have a talk to your advisor about it. But like sometimes you have to check the mineral content in your silage as well as your, um, uh, as well as the mineral content in the bag, uh, Stuart. So you, if you have had problems in the past, check the potassium content of your site. That's all we're saying, as, long, as well as the DMD, right? That's one, one point. On the minerals then, um, we're basically, we're talking about feeding minerals for sort of six weeks anyway, pre-calving. And, and the reason we're feeding for that long is to try and get the trace mineral va- uh, values up in the cows, um, particularly on some of the trace minerals anyway. So sort of six weeks pre-calving uh, and then obviously you're onto your post-calving ration that has that has um that's mineralized too a couple of quick points not to delay us too long magnesium 22 to 25 percent on the label a couple two to four percent maybe on phosphorus and then um you're going to have obviously your trace minerals as well selenium iodine uh, copper cobalt etc etc um a lot of the minerals will come in very similar on those uh, in terms of the rates. Um, the difference would be on a lot of minerals is whether they're a protected mineral source or they're a straight kind of um, uh, it's, it's an inert source or a standard source. So the difference in cost is probably whether there's a blend of, of the different types of minerals or not. I would say that's a farm by farm decision. If you think you've had problems in the past or deficiency problems in the past, there probably is uh, probably is benefit in going the extra mile in terms of the um, the protected mineral sources. If you haven't had major problems in the past, meeting the requirements on a good standard mineral will do you, right? Uh, one of the things that has come up on a few farms uh, over the last couple of years, vitamin D, uh, just make sure that your vitamin D levels are high. What this is showing you is what's in the bag versus what the cow eats. So if, essentially per kilo, if the cow's eating 120 grams, she's eating about this much. So look at 14, 12 to 14,000 units of vitamin D uh, is where a lot of the, a lot of the compounders are probably getting to at this stage. That's uh, good for milk fever control uh, as well as your, as well as your mag. And just to wrap it up, uh, Stuart, just quickly, um, just looking at three different, um, three different minerals for a second and comparing the three across the line, because this is what people ultimately Ultimately, you're going to have to do so we have our premium our super and our elite so i just, just make up whatever name you want uh magnesium at 15 percent versus 20 percent so straight away i'm probably saying yeah i'm going over here because that's too low as far as i'm concerned i'd rather see that a little bit higher even in some cases no phosphorus added there's three percent phosphorus here so certainly i'm obviously fishing in this pool uh, straight away you've got protected you can see there's no protected selenium or 
So you're, you're talking about a range of different sources. And finally, your vitamin D levels are up at 120,000 uh, in the bag versus 50,000. So you're basically saying, you know, is it worth the extra few quid or whatever to go to this level versus this level? I would say that it is. I would be happy that if you fed that for sort of your six weeks pre-calving or thereabouts uh, and transitioned the cows correctly, you're, you're, you're probably in a better place than, than, than going with this one. That's it. Okay. Oh. Okay, so there's just one question there, Joe, then, and I, um, one or two points that I'll make to you myself, then, as well. Can a lack of pee increase the risk of milk fever? A lack of pee can increase the mis- risk of milk fever. It can. So 0.3% in the diet would be sort of what's recommended. Uh, so 0.3%. So you'd look at, your silage min- look at your silage mineral analysis if you think you've had a problem. And if, there's, if, the, if it's low in phosphorus, kind of sort of three, depending on where it is, three to 5% added phosphorus in the, in the mineral should, should help to solve your problem, right? But I will make just one point on that is that if your if your if your if your bag mineral is kind of set for sort of 120 gram feeding rate, I would be suggesting that we should sort of stick to the feed recommended feeding rate because I've seen it in a couple of cases where people were maybe having problems with milk fever and they were firing in maybe 150 160 grams to try and fix the problem. The problem is with phosphorus, you can overdo it in terms of phosphorus uh, for milk fever. You can increase the risk of milk fever by feeding too much phosphorus. So, three to five percent phosphorus in a, you know, in a in a in a, in a 120 gram feeding rate is probably where you're going to going to be. So, long story short, yes, you should have it in there to improve your risk on milk fever, but don't overdo it. And the other point, of course, is if it, if it isn't in, it's automatically making a mineral cheaper because FOSS is, is expensive. FOSS is expensive. It's expensive to add in. But yeah, look, at, again, I would say, Stuart, you know, if it's, we're saying 100, sort of 100, 100, 120 gram feeding rate for, for 45 Same. days, 50 days, it's only five kilos a cow. Uh, so a ton will do 200 cows nearly. So yeah. it, the extra cost for a couple, you know, it's the extra cost is relatively small within reason now of course but the extra cost for having the right spec is um is relatively small yeah absolutely so i suppose i i would always be of the opinion it's kind of a case of buyer beware like if something is cheap you just need to look to see why is it cheap relative to other stuff that's on the market maybe and kind of dig a little bit deeper yeah exactly yeah and, yeah. and as you said like um have you what's the history of the farm as well like so if you've had problems before it's probably i would be very much against taking the cheap option in terms of minerals uh, without knowledge behind the, the decision really like so a lot of what we've spoken about is coming back to uh, feed analysis so about in the form of just knowing mm-hmm. your standard trimatter and dmd and protein levels in your silage but also the mineral content as well so people sure. should maybe be looking into that. The other question, I suppose, then, and just in relation to the in-calf heifers in terms of minerals, um, would you think that they should be getting it for a little bit longer, given that they've had no um, uh, no access to minerals, we'll say, really? Or do you know the, the fact the way that mineral grass mineral profile is, is poor or isn't 100% optimum, I suppose, is the better way to put it, rather than to say it's poor? Yeah, I know, I know, I know what you're saying, but then their, 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 their requirements, too, relative to the milking cow would be slightly lower as well. Do you know what I mean? Okay. They're, they're not... They're not um, generally. They won't be under as much. There, will, there wouldn't be the same offtake of, of 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 mineral with them. Look, at, I would say this to keep it simple, short. I would say just give you know make sure that they're all starting for sort of at least six weeks. I don't think yeah. there's a huge need for additional. One final point on that too is that when you look at that, you know the trace minerals are one thing. The um the, the major minerals like mag mag and phos are important as well. You know for those ones, you know you can't. They they have to be fed. They have to be fed in in large quantities. Uh, so basically, what you're saying is, um, you can't bolus for your major minerals, obviously. So that's just one oh, thing. Yeah, that okay. Just make yeah. sure that the the bolus will only cover the trace minerals. The trace, other, yeah. as we said, it's five kilos. The cow's going to need five kilos of, um, over the dry period. You need five kilos of total mineral intake. That's a big bolus. Like, that's not, <laughs> you know. <laughs> the, the bowlers can't do that so that's that's what i mean so look just be careful just be careful on that one so look at just to maybe for me to shut up now the first things back to john paul one of the big ones get your body condition looked at this week sort out the ones that are under underweight and think about if they're if the silage quality is very very high you may have to feed restrict during december and january if you have the feed space for doing it it might be just as simple as rest, limit limiting the um 
limiting the uh, the total silage intake per day may or may not be beneficial in that such such circum circumstances a couple of kilos of straw mightn't hurt either like just to just to slow them down a little bit right that's the first thing the second thing is if you've had niggly problems in the past do a silage mineral analysis look at your phos look at your phosphorus levels and particularly your your k levels your potassium levels if they are too high um you might need to think about maybe diluting out the diluting that out or maybe feeding some maybe their second cut silage or something might be lower in, in K. So that's the sec that's the second thing. And then the third thing then is take a look at your mineral. If it's very cheap, figure out why it's very cheap. Is it low in magnesium? Is it low in phosphorus? Is it low in the vitamins, which tend to be expensive as well? If it is, maybe you should be thinking about moving to a better a better spec overall. So I think for most people if they get on top of those few points, it can make a difference. Yeah, and I think just I suppose yep. the final you've you've done my summary there for me now, John. Fairness. Um, so <laughs> to, just the last point I, is something we were discussing yesterday evening, like that. Uh, just with with the mineral, be careful that the the couple of quid that you're saving won't cost you an awful lot more in the springtime at a time that you really want time to be messing with problems, basically. Like, so yeah. um, just to check that back. So that's uh um I, I'm loath to ask you this because I know you're uh, you've an answer for it anyway. Have you any views on choline and dry cows? Protected choline and dry cows. Yeah. Uh, the yeah, look, there, look the, the, um, you're going looking at it. We have actually there's there's myself and Mike were talking about this for a, for a, over the last couple of months about it's it's something that I suppose it's something that we're interested in in doing from from in terms of studies in Moor Park that you know the idea we're, we're sort of getting around to looking at now is for some of these different ideas or options that we would can we do things like that to prime the cows to be better to be ready really ready for 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 action when when they go for for, for in, when they calve and go for grass so for the choline I suppose and um, what the idea there would be the feed for choline it does and there is good evidence of it from some of the from the international work that it does help with fat metabolism post calving, so it helps the cow to cope with the with negative energy balance to a better degree, Stuart. So, uh, feeding for a few weeks pre calving certainly uh, to prime the system. There is some work beginning on that in, in Moor Park in the next uh, in the next couple of weeks. So, uh, while I'd say certainly there's there are um, there's good evidence that it can have a positive effect in other systems. We're having a look at it now to see what will it add in the pasture system. So the, the message really is uh, watch this space on that one, I think. Yeah, very good. Um, I'd love to call it a death saw. So just to remind people that um, we've had a lot of webinars this week, obviously, with the dairy conference and so forth. But they are, if you have missed any of them, they'll be available. And some of them are already available for people to look back at. Uh, Patrick Owing and myself are doing um, Thinking of Dairy and Getting the Basics Right series at the moment at, and that's back on again next Monday when Patrick will be looking at grazing infrastructure and I'll be looking at receding and we'll be talking to Paul and Robert Tobin in relation to their experience around grazing infrastructure and their receding plans and then next week um, Labour Management Series is back on again we'll be talking to Nullig and Marion again next week uh, about managing your time to maximum effect and just a final reminder then about Emma Louise's podcast, which are ongoing. This week's one is in relation to the surveillance and early detection of disease with, uh, with Michael Horn. So just to remind you that they're available through any of the podcast um, streaming services and to look them up. And they're always very interesting and very good. Joe, as always, a pleasure talking to you. Great information. Uh, thanks very much. And thanks, thanks to John much. McCabe Thank and thanks to John Paul as well for faci facilitating us with the cows and so forth. So uh, that's it for today, folks. We'll talk to you again next week. Uh, in the meantime, have a nice weekend and take care and mind yourselves. That's all for this week's Let's Talk Dairy webinar series. And don't forget to look out for more bonus episodes each week. I'll be back with our usual Dairy Edge interview on Monday, so do listen in then. I'm Emma Louise Coffey, and thanks for listening.